I had a thought this morning that really made me happy. And that thought is that I will never find out that I have cancer. No, I will never find out I have cancer. Now, that's not to say that I'll never get cancer. It's just to say that I'll never find out about it. Why? Because I'm never going to get a checkup. I, even, I have not had a medical checkup in 30, 20 years, 30 years, and I don't plan on having one. But Martin, you're over 50. You should get a checkup at least every year. Nope, not going to do it. <laughs> I'm just going to continue to take care of myself, to eat right, smoke an occasional cigarette, walk six miles a day. I think I'm squitting those cigarettes. I started two months ago, which is weird. Why would I start it? Just another coping mechanism, but I think I'm done. So anyway, the worst part about getting cancer is finding out the news that you have cancer. And many times it's wrong anyway. So you pay somebody a lot of money to go find out that you, quote, have cancer, unquote. You go to get a second opinion and you find out, no, you really don't have cancer. And then, of course, you enter their world and they will tell you how they can cure your cancer. And their solution is to cut and burn, which is, of course, that is surgery and chemotherapy. And it is more damaging sometimes than the disease itself. So I'm just out of that whole thing. So I'll never find out. It's great. One day I'll just get a bad stomach ache and uh, three months later I'll be dead and somebody will say, oh my God, what happened to Martin Zender? Oh, he had cancer. Oh, why didn't he do anything about it? Oh, he never found out he had it. <laughs> it just delights me. Okay, back to 1 Corinthians. Why not just say, I'm speaking to Paul now, or I'm speaking hypothetically for you toward Paul. I would never ask Paul this question. Why not just say believers and unbelievers and leave it at that? No, Paul considers it important to divide believers into two groups. I'm sorry, to divide unbelievers into two groups so that you won't be tricked or deceived by the religious unbeliever group. So Paul needs to tell you that there are two kinds of unbelievers, and then he distinguishes them again from those who are called. This tells you that religious people are not called. You remember that? I don't have to read it again. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to go back there at the end of this talk, at the end of the week. I'm going to go to Philippians chapter 1, like, soon-ish, like, now. So, religious people are not called they're just as not called as obvious unbelievers. What's the common denominator in religious unbeliever and worldly unbeliever? What's the common denominator? Is it not unbeliever? But it's not enough for Paul to say there are believers and unbelievers. He has to bifurcate and say there are two branches of unbelievers so that you won't get screwed up. So that you won't be deceived. All right, what is the destiny of these two branches of unbelievers? For this, I'm going to Philippians chapter 1. Paul is telling us in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, be citizens walking worthily of the evangel of Christ, that whether coming and making your acquaintance or being absent, I should be hearing of your concerns, that you are standing firm in one spirit. This is my desire for you also, that you be standing firm, that you not be blown about by every wind of teaching. You don't owe everyone a hearing. You must be discerning. You must be able to divide today, to make judgments between light and darkness, between Christ and Belial, between belief and unbelief. Paul's concerned about this he wants to hear about it. He wants to hear that they're standing firm in one spirit, one soul, competing together in the faith of the evangel. Competing together. I'm going to have more faith than you. Oh, yeah? I'm going to have more faith than you. Great. That's a good kind of competition. Competing together in the faith of the evangel. And how do you have more faith? By not seeing more things. By, by seeing nothing. Um... I'm sick and I still believe I have cancer and I still believe. How do you know you have cancer? You've never gotten a checkup. That's a good point. 
How about that? What kind of competition is that? You don't hear about those competitions. People compete for gold medals. People compete for a higher wage. But Paul competes to see who can suffer the most in the evangel. Remember Paul, when he lists his credentials to be an apostle, he boasts in his weakness. He tells you how he's been stoned. He's been shipwrecked. He's been beaten five times by the Jews. He's been in danger in the city, in the wilderness, by false brethren. These are his credentials because he's competing together in the faith. I still have faith and I've been beaten five times by the Jews. Chalk one up to Paul. Okay, Paul. Apostle Paul one, Martin Zender zero. I have not been beaten yet by the Jews. I wonder why. What am I doing wrong? So Paul says competing together in the faith and not being startled by those who are opposing. Paul bifurcates unbelievers so that you will not be startled that the opposition comes from those who appear to be apostles of Christ but aren't. doesn't want you being startled by those who are opposing, which is to them proof of destruction. OMG, which is to them proof of destruction. That is those who are opposing you. Those who are opposing the truth, and you present the truth, don't you? Present the truth when you tell people about the salvation of all. You tell people about the sovereignty of God. You tell people about the two evangels. You tell people about the diabolical falseness of the Trinity, and you're opposed. Every time somebody opposes you, it's proof. Paul, you, I love this word proof. I love this word. Proof. It's proof. We're afraid to see proof. We're afraid to see evidence. We're afraid in concrete things. Paul says, it's proof. I'm told all the time, you're not supposed to make a judgment, Martin, on who's a believer and who's not. No, I have proof that somebody's going to be destroyed. I have proof. What's your proof, Martin? They oppose the truth. They just proved something. It's proof to them of destruction. It's not proof to them. It's proof to you of them. Yet of your salvation. This just keeps getting better. You being opposed, especially by the religious branch of unbelievers, is proof of their destruction. It's almost like when this destruction is temporary loss. They're going to miss at least the next eon. Eon 4. Um, it's easy to see. You don't need proof that a complete atheist who says he hates Christ, says he doesn't believe that Jesus ever lived, what proof do you need that that person is going to experience loss for the eon or the, possibly the eons? What proof do you need? You don't. The proof we need comes from the hypocrite branch. As I said yesterday, uh, clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right. That would be the clowns, the left of me, the religious unbelievers. The proof is needed because those are that's the deceptive branch of the unbelievers. That's the deceptive branch. That those are the hypocrites. So this opposition is proof of their destruction and of your salvation. And this from God. This is from God. What I'm reading to you is from God. And I just happen to be giving it to you. But it's from God. Via Paul, via your friend Martin Zender. For to you. It is graciously granted for Christ's sake, not only to be believing on him, but to be suffering for his sake also. And you're suffering for his sake when you are being opposed by religious unbelievers. Remember, Jesus Christ's worst pain was suffering at the hands of his brothers. Paul's unintermittent pain in Romans 9-2 was a result of being... Uh, indirectly persecuted by the mass unbelief of his own nation. That hurts. So it's been graciously granted you because suffering is the coin of the realm in the next life. Suffering is what you want now. You'll be able to turn in a penny of suffering and get $100,000 worth of glory. This is from God, for it is graciously granted you for Christ's sake, not only to be believing on him. See, I emphasized that part of this verse before. It's graciously granting, granted you to be believing on him. Belief is a gracious gift of God 
imposed on you, but also to be suffering for his sake also. So those who are opposing, this verse also proves that they're not believers. Those who are opposing proof of their destruction yet of your salvation because it's graciously granted to you to believe. See, it's graciously granted you to believe. Paul puts this in opposition to those who are opposing you. Therefore, those who are opposing you have not been graciously granted to what? To believe. They're unbelievers. And there are two kinds of unbelievers. Religious unbelievers and worldly unbelievers. The worldly unbelievers are easy. That's why I hardly talk about them. Why bother? It's so self-evident. I talk to you mainly about religious unbelievers because that's the shock. And it's proof of their destruction of loss. This goes right around, right along with Galatians 5 that they are enemies of the cross. Where is that? Is that Galatians 5? Yeah, where? For a while, I thought it was Philippians. I said Philippians yesterday, and then I looked it up, and I thought I was wrong, and I said it must be Galatians. It is Philippians. Why did I doubt myself? It's Philippians chapter 3. I gave you a wrong reference then yesterday. I think there is another reference to, I think there is another reference to enemies of the cross in Galatians. Uh, there probably is. Paul says, remember, become imitators of me. Be noting those who are walking thus, according as you have us for a model. For many are walking, of whom I often told you, yet now I'm lamenting. This is the same kind of lament he has in Romans 9, 2. Same kind of lament. The unintermittent pain in his heart for his brethren and sistren according to flesh. I'm lamenting who are enemies of the cross, whose consummation is destruction. And what does he say in, that's also in Philippians, same chapter. That makes sense now. Philippians 3, Philippians 1, their end is destruction. Paul says to them it's proof of destruction. Now he's giving, he's giving the proof in chapter 1. That is their opposition of you. Okay, I want to end the week. If I have time here, in 1 Corinthians, uh, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, there are not many wise, not many noble. That's verse uh, 26 and 27. The stupidity of the world God chooses, remember, stupidity, that's what the cross is to the Greeks. The cross is a stumbling block, a snare to the Jews. But to us, the cross is the power and wisdom of God. Watch this. Not many wise, according to flesh, not many powerful, not many noble. But the stupidity of the world God chooses that he may be disgracing the wise. And the weakness, uh, I knew that was Philippians yesterday. I, I knew it. And I said Philippians and I second guessed myself and I put on the screen that it was Galatians. Made me look like I didn't know what, what I was talking about. But in fact, I did. Okay. Stupidity of the world God chooses that he may, that he may be disgracing the wise and the weakness of the world God chooses that he may be disgracing the strong and the ignoble and the contemptible things of the world God chooses purposely and that which is not that would that is that which is not of any reputation is not of any esteem is not of any obvious nobility that he should be discarding that which is everything is the opposite uh, it's going to be the opposite of what you see today. And in God's mind, everything is the opposite of what you see today. That which is the epicness of the world, the star power, is being discarded. So that no flesh at all should be boasting in God's sight. Yet you are of him. You are in Christ Jesus who became to us. Christ Jesus became to us wisdom from God besides righteousness and holiness and deliverance. That according as it is written, he who is boasting in the Lord, let him be boasting. Did you know that God makes stupid the wisdom of the world? Verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 1. I'm going to end with this. God makes stupid the wisdom of the world. And he says this, and I love this, verse 19. It is written, I shall be destroying the wisdom of the wise. I told you yesterday, uh, the, the jokers to the right of me, he's going to destroy their wisdom, all their highfalutin, uh, cerebral shenanigans on behalf of themselves. All their complicated opinions and their arrogance is going to be destroyed. And the understanding of the intelligent, the understanding of the intelligent, and you must say it this way, the understanding of the intelligent 
What's he going to do? He's going to be reputing, repudiating it. Repute. Pew. You hear that word in there? Repew. It's not really in there. That's just me. But it's repudiating it. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the discusser? You must say it that way. Where is the discusser of this eon? Does not God make stupid the wisdom of the world? For since, in fact, in the wisdom of God, the world... This is good. For, I keep, for since, in fact, in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom knew not God, God delights through the stupidity of the heralding to save those who are believing. He delights through the stupidity of advertising a naked man on a cross. He loves it. That that's the thing that upsets people, that makes the religious people claw like dogs trying to impress him, that makes the worldly people roll their eyes and say, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. God, I ever heard. God loves doing this. He chooses a stupid thing. Here's what the world doesn't understand. They think that our poor God is competing with the discussers and the so-called self-made brilliant people of this world. They think he's trying to compete with them. And they're so smart. They're inventing uh, great electronic devices. They're inventing supposedly great cures in the medicine world. They're building tall buildings. And what does God have to offer in this game? Uh, Noah's Ark. Uh, the story of Adam and Eve. Uh, a man dying on a cross. This is what, this is the best God can do. And the smart people who are building things and impressing us with their movies and television shows and their great songs and their and their computer programs and their software and their building materials oh ooh. they're laughing at this but their their huge mistake is that god is not trying to outdo them with his wisdom because we haven't even seen the wisdom of god all we've seen so far is the stupidity of God. But according to this testimony, the stupidity of God is wiser than humans. The stupidity of God is wiser than humans. So all these people who think they're so great and so wise, they're going to find out that actually Noah's Ark exceeded in brilliance their schemes by a hundredfold. It's actually embarrassing. Their schemes are embarrassing, not Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark was brilliance afloat. The story of Adam and Eve, that's not a story. That's our history. That's human history. But it's not as smart as evolution, is it? Oh, it's not as smart. It's not as complicated. It doesn't give as much glory to humanity. Not that evolution does. How smart do you have to be to evolve from a tadpole? I don't get it. So we're created at once by God. That's the truth. But God's not trying to impress these people. He's doing, he's using his foolishness. We haven't seen his wisdom yet. Imagine when you see his wisdom and he's going to prove to these people that even though his ark exceeds in wisdom, they're wise as schemes they could come up with. That's, I would call it funny. I would call it a funny thing that these people actually think that, except that it's tragic.